I feel like everyone dislikes the large data set, including me. I don't think maths or statistics should be assessed by your ability to remember random facts about the weather but you do need to know this, it comes up a lot. There has been a question based around the large data set in every exam they've done so far. The 2019 paper had two questions based around it. Now, you are not given the large data set in like the formula booklet or anything, but for a question, if you ever need the raw data, they will give it to you. You obviously don't need to remember that. Now, the questions on the large data set, a lot of them will be testing you on skills you learn in later chapters, like calculating standard deviation for example and for those you don't necessarily need to have seen the large data set before the exam you can just do those on the spot however they do also ask questions where you do need prior knowledge of the large data set this is the purpose of this video I'm going to tell you everything you need to know about the large data set going into your exams so this is the large data set, it's in the form of an Excel spreadsheet and I'll leave a link to it in the description if you want to have a look at it. The large data set is to do with weather. It is data collected from eight weather stations, five of them are in the UK and three of them are international. Now you need to know roughly where these locations are. So for the UK ones you need to know where they are in the UK in comparison to each other and you need to know where in the world the international ones are. Okay. So in the UK you've got Canada. Ambon, Hearn and Heathrow which are in the south of the UK and then you have Leeming and I believe the top one is pronounced Lucas. Leeming and Lucas are both in the north okay. Camden, Hearn and Lucas are also on the coast okay. Now for the non-UK ones Jacksonville is in the US, Beijing is in China and Perth is in Australia. All of the locations are in the Northern Hemisphere except for Perth. Now the locations of these places impacts the weather patterns we see in the large data set which I'll talk about in a moment. Now, for each location, data is recorded in two different years, 1987 and 2015. So what this means is in the large data set, there are kind of 16 individual data sets inside of it. You have the eight locations in 1987, and then you have the eight locations in 2015. Now, for each location and for each year, the data is recorded between May and October. So for example, on the screen right now is Cam in 1987 and you can see that the first day that they record data is the 1st of May and then they do the 2nd of May and then the 3rd of May and then the 4th of May and they do this every single day up to the 31st of October. Now another thing that you need to consider here is the seasons. Now from May to October I think the common fault is that May is spring and then June, July and August are the summer and then September and October is the autumn. I think there is a bit of debate about this. I think some people would say that maybe spring stretches a bit into June and maybe summer stretches a bit into September. It doesn't really matter that much. The main thing is that May is spring and then the main summer months are July and August and then October is the autumn if you want to remember it like that instead. Once again the seasons affect the weather patterns that we see as we'll discuss in a moment. So what actually is the data? What are we actually measuring? Okay, so for the international locations, so that's Jacksonville, Beijing and Perth, there are four measurements. Daily mean temperature, daily total rainfall, daily mean pressure and daily mean wind speed. Okay, for the UK locations, you have 11 measurements. You still have these four here on the left, but you also have these other seven measurements that you don't have the international locations. You need to have an understanding of these measurements which I'll go through now. Okay, so the first one is daily mean temperature. Okay, so to get this, every hour of the day they measure the temperature and then at the end of the day they take the mean of all those temperatures to get the measurement. Okay, the units are Celsius and everything is rounded to one decimal place. Now, the range of temperatures is about 4 degrees Celsius to 33 degrees Celsius. Some of these ranges I've got from Dr. Frost who did a really good PowerPoint on the large data set which I'll link in the description. 
It's really important that for all of these measurements, you know the range of values they give out. They have asked quite a lot of questions where they will give you like a range of numbers and you have to identify what the measurement is by what the range of numbers are. Okay, so it's really important that you know these ranges. For the seasons of the year, it's obvious it gets hottest in the summer and then it normally gets coldest in the autumn. Now, something that's really important is that Perth is in the southern hemisphere, which means its seasons are flipped. It has its winters in June, July, and August. All the other locations get hotter in June, July, and August because that is their summer except for Perth. Now, if you look at the data, these are some graphs I put together for 1987 and 2015 for Perth. It doesn't really get colder in June, July, August compared to the other months. It just doesn't get hotter, okay? Now, in the UK, the north is typically colder. And for non-UK locations, Beijing and Jacksonville are quite hot. And Beijing has a noticeably wide temperature range as well. Perth isn't that hot for the reasons I just explained with the seasons. Okay, so the second measurement is daily total rainfall. This is given to one decimal place and it's measured in millimetres. And you may have always wondered why we measure rainfall in millimetres. I thought Mr. Bison did a good video on the large data set. I'll link that in the description and he explained it quite well. Essentially, to measure rainfall at the beginning of a day, we put a measuring cylinder outside and we let it collect rain. And then at the end of the day, we just see how much rain it's collected and kind of what marker it comes up to on the measurement cylinder and that will be the total rainfall in millimeters this includes all precipitation so also snow and sleet okay the range of values is between 0 and 60 millimeters note there are quite a lot of zeros in the data which obviously indicates no rain has occurred on that day now they also have a lot of values that say TR which indicates trace trace means it's less than 0 0.05 millimeters so a very small amount of rain in an exam let's say you're given some raw data and you need to calculate the mean what do you do with the trace values they talk about this in one of the mark schemes you can just say that trace is equal to any number between 0 and 0 0.05 and just use that I personally would just say trace is equal to 0 it's just easiest to work with in terms of the seasons it's driest in the summer in terms of the UK it's wetter generally in the north in terms of the non UK trends remember Perth has its seasons flipped so therefore June, July and August are its winter which are really wet. Perth has some really heavy days in terms of rainfall, about 102 millimetres and 104 millimetres which is way higher than any other location. Just as well, Jacksonville is quite wet. Okay, so the third measurement is daily mean wind speed. This is recorded in a similar way to daily mean temperature in that they record the wind speed throughout the day and then they just find the mean at the end. Now, units are in knots or KN. If you're interested, one knot is equal to 1.15 miles per hour, but I don't think you need to know about this. Um, they are given as integers in the UK, but as decimals in international locations. The typical range is between three and 19 knots. Now note that in the data there are a lot of NA values for this measurement on multiple days. Okay. Now this probably means they had some type of equipment error and it didn't record the measurement. If you are ever working with the data and you see an NA value, just ignore that point. Don't include it in your calculation. Okay. In terms of the seasons, it is less windy in the summer and most windy in autumn. In terms of the UK, the coastal towns are typically windier. So this is Camden, uh, Hearn and Lucas at the top. And in terms of non-UK, Beijing and Jacksonville aren't that windy. Perth is pretty much the same as the UK. Now, another thing I need to mention for this measurement is as well as being given the value in knots, it is also converted to something called the Beaufort scale, okay? So rather than giving the number in knots, the Beaufort scale gives it as either light, moderate, or fresh. This is the table of conversion for the Beaufort scale. So if it's 1 to 10 knots, it means it's light. If it's 11 to 16 knots, this means it's moderate. If it's 17 to 21 knots, this means it's fresh, okay? Now, one thing that I really don't like about the large data set is in the specification, it does 
doesn't specify what you need to know exactly. I honestly don't know if you need to remember these values here, kind of the specific values for converting it between knots and the Beaufort scale. They haven't asked a question on it yet, but I'm honestly not sure if you need to know it. One thing to note that for the um, Beaufort scale, most values are either light or moderate. There aren't that many values that are fresh. Okay, so the fourth measurement is daily max gust. Note that this is the first measurement that is only for the UK and is not for the international stations, okay? This is extremely similar to the last measurement, the daily mean wind speed, but instead of it being the mean wind speed, it's the maximum wind speed of that day instead. We call it the max gust. The units are the exact same. The range is between 8 and 52 knots, and the trends are the exact same as the previous. Okay, so the fifth measurement is daily mean wind speed direction. This is only for the UK, okay? So for the third measurement, which was daily mean wind speed, this is just the direction the wind is coming from, okay? Now, there are two units here that they can use. They can either give it as an angle, and they'll give it as a bearing, if you remember back to GCSE maths. So remember how a bearing works, if it's something like 110 degrees. If you remember bearings, we start from the north. If we say 110 degrees is something like this here this is the direction the wind is coming from, okay? It can take any value between 0 and 360 degrees and it's rounded to the nearest 10 degrees, okay? Now, the second possible unit is a cardinal point, which is essentially just a compass point, okay? And they'll give this as a letter, so either north, northeast, east, southeast, etc. They can also go more specific and say something like east southeast and what this essentially means is if you look at a compass if kind of the direction is between east and southeast this is east southeast like this here okay and um, there are not really any trends here with the seasons or where it is in the uk it's just kind of random Okay, and then the sixth measurement is the daily max gust direction. This is also only for the UK. This works the exact same as the previous one, but it's rather than being for the daily mean wind speed, it's for the daily max gust instead, and it works the exact same way. Again, there's not really any trends here. However, one thing I will say is that the max gust direction and the mean wind speed direction are normally the same. Okay, so the seventh measurement is daily mean pressure, and again, this is for all locations. So again, they record pressure all throughout the day, and then they just find the mean at the end, okay? This is given in hectopascals, and it's rounded to the nearest integer. The range is between 988 and 1038. Again, the ranges are important. They have actually asked an exam question before specifically on this range for daily mean pressure. Um, I've had a look at the, um, the large data set. I don't think there are any trends here. I think it's just random. Okay, so the eighth measurement is total sunshine. Just FYI, the rest of the measurements are only for the UK, okay? This is how many hours of sunshine there were in a day. It's given in hours, and it's rounded to one decimal place. Now, the range of values is between 0 and 14 hours. It's quite weird to think the number of hours of sunshine in a day is 0, and there are actually quite a few zeros in the data. This is if there were really thick clouds or if it, if it was really overcast and it stops any sunshine from being recorded. In terms of the seasons, there is more sunshine in the summer, and in terms of the UK, there is less sunshine as you go north. To be honest, this isn't actually really reflected in the data, but that is scientifically true. So the ninth measurement is daily max relative humidity. This is the maximum humidity recorded throughout the day. This is a percentage to the nearest integer and the range of values is 80% to 100%. I've had a look. I don't think there are any real trends here, but something it mentions in the book is if humidity is greater than 95%, this can give rise to mist or fog. As this is mentioned in the book, and it's actually also mentioned in the Excel spreadsheet for the large data set, I think it's possible they could ask about this at some point.
Okay, so the tenth measurement is daily mean total clouds. Now, this is a really weird measurement. It's in a unit called octas. And essentially what they do, they have a portion of the sky and they have a grid and they divide the sky into eight sections. And however many sections have clouds in it, that's the measurement. So in this kind of diagram here, I've tried to show what's going on. In this one, you can see that two of the sections have clouds in it. So therefore, this would be two octas like this here okay so therefore octas can take any integer value between 0 and 8 if it's 0 there are no clouds if it's 8 there are loads of clouds it can't be a decimal it can only be an integer um, I've had a look I don't think there are any trends here Okay, so the 11th and final measurement is daily mean visibility. This is given in decameters or dm, and 1 dm is equal to 10 meters, but I don't think you need to know that. Um, they get this measurement by just seeing the furthest distance an object can be seen on a particular day. So the further meters away or decameters away they can see an object, the greater the visibility is. As I said, the units are in decameters and rounded to the nearest 100 decameters and the range is between 200 and 5000 although there are some values that lie outside this range both above and below once again i don't think there are any trends it's pretty random so here is just a table summarizing everything i've said if you want it for your notes this is for measurements one to six and then this is measurements seven to eleven so just to recap, what do you need to know? Okay, so you need to know the 11 measurements. You need to remember broadly the eight locations and where they are in the UK and then for the non-UK ones where they are in the world. You need to remember the range of values a measurement can have. I want to emphasize this again. They've asked quite a few exam questions based around this. You really need to know it. You need to know the units and the possible values a measurement can give out. So for example, for daily mean total clouds the units are okras and it can only be an integer value between 0 and 8 you need to know how data varies through the season so the summer is hotter brighter drier and less windy you need to know how data varies in the UK so the north of the UK is colder wetter and darker you need to know how the data varies internationally as well again the seasons in Perth are flipped um, something I haven't mentioned in this video yet as I talked about data is recorded in two Two different years 1987 and 2015 they mention on the large data set about comparing the data for the same location between 1987 and 2015 and they also specifically mention global warming and if you look at the data the daily mean temperature for every single location has gone up in this time period between 1987 and 2015. I am almost certain at some point they will ask a question about this. Um, some of the questions talk about cleaning the data, such as this one from the AS paper in 2019. Cleaning the data just means dealing with the trace and the NA values. When you're working with the data, just say the trace values are equal to zero and then ignore the NA values when you're doing calculations. Um, one other thing I want to mention as well, because they've asked a couple of questions on this. They've asked a question before where they talk about using the data in the large data set to model the weather for the entire year in the UK. That obviously wouldn't work as we've only recorded the summer and parts of spring and autumn. Winter, which we haven't recorded, is the coldest, wettest, darkest and windiest month. So this data that is in the large data set cannot be used to show what the weather is going to be like all year okay um, i'm not going to go through any exam questions in this video as i'm planning to dedicate an entire video to it at some point i'm not 100 percent sure when i'm going to upload this yet but i will get it up before this year's exams um, and if you're really weird and you love the large data set and you want to see more content on it for some insane reason um, i've mentioned already but dr frost and mr bison made very good content on uh, it which i'll link both of them in the description